Hello, everyone. If you like what I'm doing here, please consider subscribing, liking, and commenting. It would really help the channel out quite a bit. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm John Sessions. When I was a child, Sunday lunchtime meant the smell of roast dinner and the sound of Al Reed on the wireless. With nothing more than his voice and, occasionally, a sound effect or two, he created what he called Pictures from Life. I could see, with that vision only radio brings, every one of his characters. Inquisitive kids, flat-capped men, big women in hairnets and pinnies gossiping over the garden fence. One of these days she'll bite off more than she can chew. <laughs> I says, oh, I knew what was coming. I says, oh, I says, no, I says, but you, I says, oh, no, she jumps up and she says, oh, he says, oh, he says, um, there was enough said at our Billy's wedding. <laughs> I thought, right, monkey. I was brought up in Kipling Street in Salford. Al Reed, recorded in 1987, shortly before he died. More than that, I was brought up on the gossip in Kipling Street. It went on every day and the subjects were... Illness, death, marriage, divorce and pregnancy. I can remember as a kid overhearing two women stood at the corner of Lily Street and Arbuckle Grove. I didn't know at the time what they were talking about, but it went something like this. Not another, what she's got for already. He must be a beast, you know, a beast. And our Florrie had the right idea. She told him from the very start and she was right. She said, once a year on your birthday. And do you know, he does look forward to it. <laughs> so, there was gossip everywhere. No, I could see they were out for some fun. And this fella... <laughs> oh, he was a lovely fella. He came up straight away. <laughs> no, straight away he came up and he put his arm round me, called me gorgeous. <laughs> oh, and he was strong. <laughs> I said, here, I said, watch where you've got your arm. You're squashing all my spot prizes. <laughs> I thought, yes. I thought, yes. You'll take a bit of watching in the pally glide. <laughs> anyway, he said, uh, no, no, he said, uh, come on, kid. Me, kid. Me, kid. <laughs> he said, uh, come on, kid. He said, I'm running you home in my car. Then he tried to lift me. He tried to lift me. Oh, and he was strong. <laughs> I said, uh, I said, get off your daft thing. I said, there's people looking. <laughs> no, he said, uh, no, he said, I, he said, I wasn't kidding about the car. He said, uh, he said, oh, he said, you don't need to worry. He said, I'm taking you straight to your house. Well, I was terrified. I was terrified. <laughs> For the first two miles, I thought he was going to until he passed it. They only went out once a month then. Comedy writer and producer, Jim Casey. And so every month... Al Reed came on the radio and it was like Morgan Wise on television. Well, I mean, it was just the event of the month when Al Reed came on. He was like a one-man Coronation Street. Comedy historian Mike Craig. Because there were more than the wife from the kitchen and the Johnny Noel. There was the little boy at the theatre, in the barber shop, in the doctor's surgery. A little lad in a man's world. Hey, Dad, Dad, is this the barber shop, Dad? You know, hey, look at these magazines, Dad. They've got pictures of ladies with no clothes on, Dad. Are they like me, Mum, Dad? Have they nothing to wear? Beautiful comedy of life, that. At the time, it was sort of brand new. It was real new comedy stuff, you know? Al Reed fan, Ricky Tomlinson. And uh, my, my earliest memories are listening to the radio, to this, like, sort of big, gruff, know-all guy and a little timid guy that would sort of answer him back, you know. And he'd say things like, uh, you're not trying to get in that football match, are you? <laughs> you'll be lucky, I'll tell you, you'll be lucky. Chap in front of us, just gone home and he's playing centre forward. It was the Abbott and Costello and, and, and what have you, you know. One was the boss and, and one was the little meat guy. And it was just that sort of thing, you know. Oh dear, I think I'll try the terraces. Locked and barred half an hour ago. Why, are they packed? Packed. They've got that many in there, they're offering twice what they paid to go in to come out. <laughs> That mounted policeman's doing no good. Uh, why? Has he lost his temper? No, he's lost his horse. 
Oh, oh dear, well, I must get in somewhere. They'll do no good here till they shift some of these directors. Oh? They've passed it, I'll tell you. <laughs> Chairman's been with them that long, he's forgotten which division they're in. <laughs> Smoking cigars and supping whiskey in that boardroom. I could do that. That's twice this season they've had to come out and stop him cheering the wrong team. <laughs> well, look what happened when they paid all that money for a new left half. He was penalised 27 times for hands before they found out he was a wing three-quarter. <laughs> Have you come far? Yes, you'd never get home. <laughs> like a stampede here when he blows full time. Well, I don't mind that if I can get in. I'll, I'll bet I'm first on the ground next week. Well, I should set off now. They're playing Hungary away. <laughs> that's the north. That's what we are, and that's what makes it funny. It's not made up. It's not compromised. It's not phony. It's the real McCoy. And people, if given the chance, will always sit back and laugh at themselves. And he had this wonderful art of making ordinary conversations, ordinary little situations, and turn him into tremendous humour. But, I mean, he, he was an northern guy, wasn't he? He was from Salford, although he didn't come into the business, apparently, till he was quite old, till he was in his 40s. And he wasn't a working-class guy, I wouldn't have thought, by his background. His grandparents owned uh, a sausage and, and pie factory. I said to my brother Bill one day, we're waiting for dead men's shoes, you know. He said, well, you're doing all the shouting, you asked me, Dad. So I did. He said, so you want to go on your own? I said, yes. He said, all right, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll start you off. I'll find you the building. I'll equip it for you. And then you're on your own. And that's exactly what happened. And I'll never forget one day, I went to a big sausage machinery factory and talking to the young boss, I said, what's that in the corner of that machine there? He said, that, you don't want that. He said, that is for big, big manufacturers. It's a sausage filler. He said, the marvellous machine, made in Germany, and it can turn out sausages at the rate of £90 a minute. Anyway, to cut a long story short, my dad bought it at my suggestion, insistence, in fact. Now, having got him to buy this enormous, expensive, elaborate machinery, it was up to me to make sure we had it in constant use. In other words, to get some big orders... And I was a bit lucky, but not a bad salesman in a way. I pulled off rather a nice little deal, the Navy, Army and Air Force contract. So, suppliers of sausages. You can imagine what that meant. That little factory in Salford was working all hours, day and night. It was hard work, and I did my fair share of it. I can't understand you. You come home cracking your fagged out and you won't eat your tea or kick your shoes off and it's, oh, I must have an early night tonight. Get slumped down in front of the fire, out to the wide with your head lolling all over the place. And then at quarter past eleven, when I ask you if you're coming to bed, you wanted to play me at ping pong. <laughs> no wonder the window cleaner mistook me for your mother. At that time, we, we had the sausage factories, meat factories, and I was uh, delivering uh, the, the stuff, you see. There was a shop at Swinton in Lancashire, uh, a butcher shop, and uh, I drew up there, and the curtains were all drawn, you know, and uh, there am I balancing a 40-pound basket of sausages on my knee and think, well, I wonder if I'll have to... And she opened the door. Mrs. Chap walked open the door, and it started. <sighs> I heard this bump, you know... So I went upstairs and there he was on, on the, the landing. landing. Well, I didn't know what to do. I mean, he's such a weight, you know. He's seventeen and a half stone, you know. And well, I couldn't lift him. I couldn't shift him. I thought, whatever shall I do? And everything's showing, you know. <laughs> anyway, I put this blanket round him best I could. I raced downstairs, flew out of the front door. Ran round the corner and hammered on their window, but they were out. I tried next door. They had the television set on and cracked on the contemis. Well, I thought, well, I don't know what to do now. So uh, I went back into the house, went upstairs, and anyway, as I say, when I got upstairs, there he was, sat up in bed reading. 
I first met Al Reed like most people, I suppose, on the wireless in 1950, 51. Mike Craig. Uh, and I think that's where we mainly met Al Reed. His voice, his characters, his catchphrases came out of our wireless sets. And I think Al Reed was possibly the last in that line of, of radio greats. It's amazing to think that he had 20 million listeners. And he had because television wasn't there. Well, it may have been down, you know, from Alexandra Palace, but it wasn't all around the country, and that's what they tuned into. He was essentially a wireless person. He painted wonderful pictures. He told the truth. He was a teller of truth, was Al Reed. His comedy was the comedy of life, the comedy of truth. He was a pie maker. His granddad was a pie maker, and he ran the factory, and he loved it, and that was his world. He bored people to death with his stories. He was always a frustrated performer. I've spoken to scores of people who knew Al Reed in his younger days, before he was famous. People in the pie business knew him. And they said, Al Reed used to get you at the golf club and he'd pin you to the wall and make you listen to his latest party piece. I was in the bar on the central pier, Blackpool, doing what I often did in those days, making the people around me laugh. There was a small crowd of holidaymakers round us, and I can remember doing a bit about a doctor's surgery. At the end of which, a gentleman who stood at the back of the room came over to me, and he said, I'm Peter Webster, the children's entertainer. He said, very funny what you've just done. Would you like to come with me on Sunday next to the Middleton Towers holiday camp? I take a show there, and I think that would go very well. So I said, yes, yeah, all right. I did my bit, and it went well. Everybody laughed. Mind you, it was a free audience. They hadn't paid to come in. So I think that helped. After the show, a gentleman with a big cigar came up to me, and he said, my name is Jack Taylor. You may have heard of me. I said, yes, of course. An impresario. He said, I have the South Pier Theatre. He said, I would very much like you to come and do that comedy turn at my theatre. I said, yes, yes, indeed, not half. So I went home and said to my wife, I'm doing this South Pier. She said, oh, well, we better get some support. I'll ring your Auntie Flory, and she can bring a few of her friends. So she did. Now... Sad to say, this story doesn't have the happiest of endings. I went to the South Pier on the night in question, full of expectations, hope, and God knows what. But that audience had paid, and I wasn't up to their standard. It was terrible. I just played to silence. In fact, it was so bad, halfway through, I just walked off, and I was all set for going home, and I suddenly thought, my Auntie Flory and all the relatives in the audience. As I walked out of that stage door, there they all were, like a lot of seals, waiting for me to throw a bit of fish. Talk about being embarrassed? And my Auntie Flory walked forward. She said, Don't you worry, love. You look very nice and clean, any road. This frustrated comedian, Al Reed, basically was a man running a pie firm, waiting to be discovered <laughs> as a comic. It was 1950, he was 42. And quite honestly, nobody outside the meat pie and sausage industry had ever heard of Al Reed. He lived in Lytham St. Anne's in those days. He got on. Yet he still worked hard, 13 hours a day. You know, half past seven in the morning he went to work, came back half past eight at night. He was a hands-on managing director. He came home one night to Lytham St. Anne's. I'd hardly time to take my shoes off when it started. My wife, what are you going to do about my mother? Your mother? My mother's coming a week on Friday and she's not going to sleep in that little back bedroom like it is. It's a disgrace. Well, never mind, love, I'll do it. You'll do it. You needn't bother because I've got a decorator to call and give us an estimate. She said he's at the door now. And there he was stood on the step, the first loudmouth, really, for Johnny Noel. How do you do? 
I said, oh, how do you do? He said, uh, I believe you want the house decorating through. Oh, no, I said, no, 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 nothing like that. No, no. I said, it's my wife, her mother's coming a week on Friday, and uh, it's a little back, but not taking the blind bit of notice. I said, come in. He came in. He's looking round. He said, uh, is this your own house? Have you bought it? I said, uh, yes. He says, pity. Bad property, this, he says. Bad property. Built on sand near Blackpool, you see. He said, and, uh, well, I don't know, did you decorate it in this hall? But my God, they didn't know the job. They did not know the job. They did not. They did not know the job. He said, you see what happened to your skirting boards? And he kicked it. And the paint dropped on the carpet. He said, it's never been bonded, that, you see. Has never been bonded. This decorator gave Al Reed his latest party piece. The Johnny Noel had walked into his life. A man who knows everything. He perfected that story into a little cameo that he worked at the golf club, at the factory. He'd do it at the drop of a hat, frustrate a comic. Later that year, Al Reed's firm was giving its annual lunch for the meat pie buyers of the Northwest. The thank you for your custom Christmas lunch in the Queen's Hotel, Manchester. It was a habit, about quarter past five, of a gentleman from the BBC in Piccadilly across the road to come into the bar in the Queen's Hotel and have a large gin and tonic before he got his train to Wilmslow. This man was called Bowker Andrews. In the next room, Al Reed was thanking his guests at the end of what had been a wonderful lunch and now they were on the port and brandy and everybody was in a mellow mood. Captive audience, frustrated comedian, he can't resist it. I'm stood at the back and they're not taking a blind bit of notice of me. I thought, well, this is all my... Must attract attention. So I thought, right, monkey, I did the routine. Of course, they all turned round and it's just a strange sound, you see. And it's me. And then, now having a captive audience, hmm, I told them the perfectly true story. He goes into his latest party piece about the decorator. Balgar Andrews hears laughter. He opened the door, and through this half-open door, he saw Al Reed. When it was all over, Barker Andrews went in, fought his way through these meat pie buyers, and approached Al Reed and said, that's the funniest thing I've heard in years. And Al Reed swore to me, I swear, he said, I said to him, well, thank you very much, but this is a private party. Splendid, I'll have a large gin. <laughs> he said, oh, I've never heard any so funny. I said, well, it's true. He said, but... Oh, he said, we must have that on the radio. He said, will you come and do it on Variety Fanfare? I want you next week to come on that show and do exactly what you've just done for these people. If you get flooded out under this door when it rains... Uh, yes, you might well. Those paths are sloping the wrong way for a start. <laughs> That's a job you won't do before you touch anything. Of course, you please yourself. Doesn't matter to us one way or the other. I say it doesn't matter one way or the other to us. Have they said anything next door about this wall? Uh, no. They will do. <laughs> Only needs a touch and that wall's over. Of course, you please yourself. Doesn't matter to us one way or the other. I say one way or the other doesn't matter to us. But in any case, you'll need that wall pointing. How far up, I can't say. We'll tell you better when we get your scaffolding up. Malcolm Rand introduced me to a man called Ronnie Taylor. Ronnie Taylor got down the decorator routine onto paper, improved it, honed it, taught Al Reed basic microphone technique, rehearsed him, and the following week, Al Reed went on the wireless. Simple as that. Ronnie was the perfect mentor for Al. He understood Al's humour. He understood the comedy of life. He understood the comedy of the streets of Salford. Ronnie was the right man to steer Al Reed. And, of course, Al Reed just had this gift. Al Reed himself probably created the characters. Jim Casey. And Ronnie probably wrote most of the actual script. That happens. I did the same thing with Les Dawson. Les used to create nearly all the characters on the radio show, but I wrote all the script. And I think Ronnie Taylor did the same thing with Al Reid. So from then on, Ronnie and he collaborated, and then when Ronnie became a producer, he produced the Al Reid show, and... Um, Al was very dependent on Ronnie, and so, although he could be awkward, I think with Ronnie, he was pretty well subdued compared with anybody else. Al obviously admired him. Ronnie was the sort of guy you had to admire. Al Reed 
obviously contributed because he was a man who would contribute to the material. He had a lot of Salford in his mind from growing up in the place. Remember, when he was seven or eight, his dad used to take him on the terraces of Manchester United to see them play. And where better can you pick up the salt of the um, northwestern earth than on the terraces of Man United? Offside! Offside a mile! Get some glasses, Red! <laughs> Of course it was outside, of course it was. It took me both right off. I should think so. Get up, Barrett, you're not hurt. Like a big tart, I'm not kidding. Somebody ruffles his hair, he wants his pants changing. I'd been on the wireless, I'd established myself, when Henry Hall rang me and he said, Al, John Capstack has told me he's putting the show in this year at the Central Pier, Blackpool. If you would star in the show, I will put the production in. What do you say? I said, I've never been on the stage before in my life. What do you want me to do? He said, do the decorator sketch. It takes about ten minutes. He said, what term... Can you leave the factory? I said, any time, I'm the boss. That's it then. As long as you're here at quarter to seven every night, we're in business. Oh, by the way, I've got a great title for the show. I said, what is it? He said, right monkey. Sixteen weeks of packed houses. Once that ball had started to roll, it just snowballed. He was in his own show on the Central Beer Blackpool, literally within a year of doing that first variety fanfare. It's his first series, did it? The Al Richo. And the whole nation talked about him. The whole nation. They were saying right monkey in, in, in Eastbourne and they didn't know what it was about. But when he was doing that first show at Blackpool on the Central Pier, he was top of the bill. He was packing that theatre. His name was packing that theatre. And he had the shortest spot on the show. The jugglers did longer than he did. And he was very conscious of this. <clears throat> and he didn't like the idea that the top of the biddle should only do six and a half, seven minutes. So he went to see Henry Hall one day. And he said, Henry, I've um, been thinking. I could pad my spot out a bit with a few um, jokes I I've got together about uh, the wife and the... Uh, and, and the family, the mother-in-law, you know, which fit in with the wife in the kitchen. What do you think? And Henry Hall, to his eternal credit, said to Al Reed, No, Al, no. He said, Why, Henry? He said, Al, never, ever let him see how bad you are. And you see, so many people have let the public see how bad they are. He wasn't a joke teller. He was a retailer of life stories. You know, he, that's what he did. He, he reenacted scenes from life. And nobody did it better. Ooh, 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 ooh. Come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. Ooh, come here. Come in, it's all right. I've got him by the collar. No, no, let me shut the door. If you touch that door, he'll go for you. <laughs> Woo! Come here! Come here! <laughs> See? Squeeze past at the back while I've got him. <laughs> Only I don't let him go. He's not had his dinner. <laughs> Woo! Now then, now then. Woo! Woo! Now then, now then. Woo! Now then! Now then, Mr. Uh, he's taking it his like to you. He does sometimes. <laughs> He'll be all right if you just sit there and say nothing. <laughs> or they don't move till he lies down. <laughs> Woo! Hey, come here! <laughs> he wants to put his face near yours. <laughs> I shouldn't let him kiss you. 
You'll be all right if you don't move. He'll come down when he's ready. Hello, he's got your hat. <laughs> It'll be all right, he'll spit it out. I'm in the middle of the decorator sketch one night. When I had this commotion, I looked down, and in the middle of the third row, there's a little lad digging his mum in the ribs. And he shouted at the top of his voice, Mum, when's the monkey coming on, Mum? Mum, when is the monkey coming on? I want to see the monkey. I want to see the monkey, Mum. When's the monkey coming on? Who's oh, that man with a gold braid on his cat? Why don't you answer? Is he an admiral, Dad? Is he, Dad? Dad? <laughs> and he got his tummy low down, Dad? Dad? <laughs> if he's an admiral, has it gone down with his ship? <laughs> What does he do, Dad? Tells people where to go, does he, Dad? Dad, does he tell people where to go? Oh, look, he's shouting right down that lady's ear. Is he telling her where to go? <laughs> hey, Dad, is he, Dad? Oh, look, I think she's going. <laughs> Why are we sitting here, Dad? Why can't we sit at the front? Is this seat broken, Dad? See, watch, when I pull it down, it whizzes back. Can I have a whiz with yours, Dad? Oh, you've sat on the floor, haven't you, Dad? <laughs> Well, I didn't know you'd be sitting down, did I, Dad? <laughs> See, there's Mrs. Smith. She can't find a seat. There's one over there. Oh, look, she's racing that old man for it. She'll get it. She will. She won't. She will. She will. Hey, that's not fair, is it, Dad? She stripped him up. <laughs> Hello, Mrs. Smith. Where's your other face? Oh, yes, she has another face, Dad. I know, because I heard me ever tell my mother yesterday that Mrs. Smith was two-faced. <laughs> what do you keep telling me to watch for? To hear that laughter was wonderful. Marvellous. And to think that only three years before that, I'd never been on the stage at all. Up to then, all I'd ever done before was the wireless. He had other characters. He had the drunk, you know. Have, have, have I offended you? Have I, have I offended you? The drunk that just says the one line over and over again. The henpecked husband who's got his wife and is on the phone and he's... Uh, uh, hello? Is it... Is, is that the hospital? <laughs> the hospital? Oh, um... <laughs> how's... How's the mother? No, no, her mother. No, she, she's that big woman on Ward 9. You, you can't mistake her. Uh, as you go in on the left, she's in the first two beds. <laughs> yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, no, only we're very worried about her. Yes, she's got our premium bonds in her handbag. <laughs> yes. Well, when we rang last night, you said she was as well as could be expected, only we're a bit worried because we weren't expecting much. Just, 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 just a minute. Just a minute. <laughs> he says she spent a restless night. Shall I tell him you found her pyjamas? Uh, hello? Hello? <laughs> you, don't, you don't happen to know if she's had a blood transfusion, do you? <laughs> Only we left a bottle of black currant juice on the locker. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes, and when, when our Fred called at visiting time, he said it was empty. <laughs> empty. On, only with the night sister wearing glasses and pub pum. Yes, well, the specialist was seen her this morning and we were wondering if he said anything. Well, do you know if he managed to get a word in? <laughs> Just oh, a, do, 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 a minute. Catchphrases. Where do they come from? I thought, right, monkey. You were lucky. So you were lucky. Those aren't my catchphrases. They're yours. I never had a catchphrase in my life. It's what I heard every day of my life in the streets of Salford. The two drunks coming home at 11 o'clock at night with some some stuff tonight. With some 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 stuff tonight. <laughs> Dreaming up a tip. 
You were quick. We've only just dialed 999. <laughs> Funniest thing in the world. We're locked. Well, we were. We're all right. Now we've seen you. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, now... Can we have you off the street? It's after midnight. Hey, don't raise your arm to me, officer. <laughs> Let's have it straight. I'm not going anywhere till I find my rattle. <laughs> that rattle's important to me. Hey, Norman, where's my rattle? Did I put it down on that bar when I went for a packet of fags? Will you have one, officer? Will you have one? <laughs> now, look. I'm going to give you exactly two minutes to get off the street. Right, I'll set my watch. <laughs> They're all taken from life. There was one catchphrase I had which I can remember hearing very vividly for the first time. There were a few people there, I can see it now, when suddenly the door opened at the bottom end of the room. There's a character standing there. He didn't speak, he just looked round, saw us all, and he said, Oh, a party. Good, I'll join you. Well, silence. Embarrassed. We looked at each other, said nothing. He said, what's up with you? I've not said anything wrong, have I? Which he hadn't, of course. Have I said anything wrong? Have I said anything wrong? Still, embarrassed silence. And then he started to walk towards the table and picked out the lady nearest to him. He said... I've not offended you, have I? Have I offended you? Just say, have I offended you? No, don't look away. Have I offended you? She didn't answer. He went to the next one. He said, have I offended you? Just say. And don't, don't just turn your head away. Just answer straight out. Have I offended you? That wasn't scripted. Nobody wrote that. It wasn't planned. It just happened. It came straight from life. It's a wonder to me you're the teacher come home at all. <laughs> That's the wife from the kitchen. Uh, how do you mean, love? <laughs> Where do you think you've been till this time? This is the fifth night running we've had this caper. <laughs> you can just come out of that oven. I've given your tea to the cat. <laughs> and whose hat have you got on? <laughs> You're getting with the wrong set altogether. <laughs> See, it was quarter past one when they trundled you home last night. You'd been somewhere... And I don't suppose you remember getting in bed with me with that cigar and asking me for a light? <laughs> and because I wouldn't answer, you whipped all the clothes off me and said, have I offended you? You must have been dreaming. See, don't just throw your overcoat down anywhere. And come here. Come here. How long have you been using women's perfume? <laughs> I'll have you followed one of these nights. Not safe to be let out. I heard all about the work's dinner, getting yourself sat next to that Sylvia out of the office. about it, whispering to her and saying we're entitled to do this once a year. <laughs> and putting your arm round her and saying, come on, let's do three years in. <laughs> I heard. Who told you that? I've noticed before. You make too much fuss of her. It was just the same with that dance we went to. You see, you were all over her there. I could have smacked your face when you helped on with that fur coat. <laughs> then when I asked you to pass mine, you said, oh, what did you bring that thing for? You're listening to Right Monkey.
a celebration of the comedy of Al Reed with me, John Sessions. Obviously, he's playing to people who will understand that speed of patter. That's the way they talk. He's talking the way people talk. Although I have to say that, um, you know, as a child, I don't think I'd ever met a northern person, apart from Scottish people. But I had no knowledge of the north of England at all. And I was introduced to the north of England really by Al Reed and Ken Dodd. And the whole thing of, of character comedy, you know, has always appealed to me. Probably because I, I can't do jokes. I can't stand up and tell jokes. But uh, suddenly going into a character, being a character, that's what gives one freedom, you know. And, of course, the, the great uh, business with Al Reed is the, is the constant interjections and the stopping and the starting in response to the other person, which I don't know if it ever actually gave me the idea, but I know it was a, a, when I started messing around at school and later at university when I started doing one-man shows, the thing of, let's say, for example, you know, talking about Keith Richards and talking for a bit, and then suddenly Jagger comes in, oh, you see? And, you'll say that, and then very quickly going from one to the other, which I've always liked, to do two, three, four people at once and creating a little world rather than just being one person talking to an audience I, I got from Al Reed. In February 1953, Al's universal popularity was confirmed by an invitation to appear in a royal gala program of radio variety hosted by Ted Ray. Well, on with the show and on with the young man who in a very short time has made a great bid for stardom. Looking at life, here is Al Reed. <laughs> Now then, Mr. <laughs> Shall I get in? <laughs> it's been very much colder, hasn't it, Mr. <laughs> oh, dear. I was forgetting. I should be behind the wheel. <laughs> You're not firmly for that, will you, Mr. <laughs> Now, Mr... Uh, I'll just back it out and we'll get on with the fun. <laughs> reverse. Let's see. First, second. There it is. Reverse. That's up to the left. Here we go, then. <laughs> Shall not have it. <laughs> Try one of these others. <laughs> No, no. Oh, not let it beat me. I'll get it in somewhere. <laughs> now then, Mr... Have a past. He was a radio star, really. I'd never seen him. Dora Bryan. I mean, you don't get that now, do you? But I worked with Al in the Al Reed show at the Opera House, Manchester... And then we also did a summer season, the Al Reed show again, at the Pavilion Bournemouth, and Marty Wilde was the bottom of the bill. In fact, uh, Al used to grumble about those noisy kids. It was Marty Wilde and his wildcats. And it was very noisy, you know. We weren't used to that, Al and I, you know, all that amplified sound. I used to get my kind of fans. Marty Wilde. And he obviously would get his... But it's not the only time that I've ever been billed with uh, odd people and, you know, people with a different sort of background to me. In the old days, they used to put me with, say, fire eater, a juggler, and... But they did that in those days, so working with Al wasn't something, really, that was strange to me. I didn't speak a, a lot to Al because I wasn't that kind of guy anyway, so I was a very shy person at that point. But I had this image of Fal be even before the show started because I'd been told that he was a businessman and he owned this sausage factory. <laughs> I had this vision of this man <laughs> turning up in the morning, you know, like, morning, Mr. Reed, and that's, how's the sausage production lines? So stuff like that, you know. That's how I imagined him. When I did actually meet him, it had never changed. I still thought that. And I used to think that Al was funny, but he was... In fact, Al was really, in some ways, ahead of his time, I think. There's lots of the northern uh, type humour here now. Al was doing years and years ago. But um, well, I think the only thing we had in common, that I, I started to wear suits at that time. But Al Reed, I always imagined and had seen in photographs as a man who wore a, an immaculate suit and a tie and a trilby. He wore a, a dinner jacket, you know, for his uh, stand-up stuff. And it, it's not the same, is it? Because you see these characters in dirty Macs and flat caps. How do you do? Uh, how do you do? 
Have you come for advice about your health? Yes. Well, if you take mine, you'll go while you've still got it. <laughs> anyway, if you do stay, I should get your name down for a wheelchair. Oh, I'm not ready for one of those yet. You will be by the time you've seen this fella. <laughs> Why, I thought you could go straight in. Straight in? You'll be lucky. I'll say you'll be lucky here, that Flory. <laughs> See, you've about as much chance of getting in here as she has of becoming a band dancer. <laughs> well, I should be all right. I'm a private patient. I don't care if you're a private detective. You're not going in before me. <laughs> oh, dear, I, I hope he won't be long. Well, wait up for yourself. I'll say wait up for yourself. There's these over here, all them in that corner, right down this side, along that wall to that lady in the green hat. Then there's us, and you're after that bus conductor with the black eye. <laughs> now, if you want to try jumping the queue, ask him. He hasn't got that when he came in. <laughs> and this fellow do you no good. Well, listen, he's been having a purple bottle and a box of pills week after week, regular crop work, and enjoyed it. This fella takes one look at her and then goes for her with a needle. <laughs> he given her 14 injections before he found he was looking at the wrong card. <laughs> I don't know what he was pumping in her. But it's all I could do to stop her from wearing pigtails and playing hopscotch. <laughs> well, look at the trick he played on me. I say, look at the trick he played on me. All I wanted was a sick note for a day off work. He could see there was nothing wrong with me. <laughs> and he made me strip right off. I wouldn't care, but I'd only wash for a stiff neck. <laughs> it's like a, a boxer who leads with one fist and uh, keeps the other one just for reserve. And they know all, of course, is driving the scene. It's, it's quite minimal having the other character just coming in for a little interjection. Something I do myself, you know. You realise there's more weight on another character. One character is driving a scene and... Scenes that are difficult to do, or worse than that, don't come off so well, in my own case, is when you try and spread the weight evenly. And uh, it does really help, even if you bring two or three other voices in, that one person is really driving the scene and pushing it forward. And it's interesting, he didn't do the wife there at all. You know, The whole thing is, is driven on and on and on. And eventually, you know, Al Reed, the comedian, as it were, gets his revenge, as it were, on the man who seems to be the man in control. But he's a wonderful scene setter as well. He paints the scene beautifully. And he's not scared to stop and paint the scene a little bit. You know, you see the whole waiting room, of course, once again, radio, you know. And on the television, you say, that fellow over there, that fellow over there, and there's just the curtains. And you can imagine him doing that on the television. And let's say they gave a waiting room around him, as Hancock and June Whitfield and Patrick Cargill will all have had in a blood donor sketch. It wouldn't be the same, because if you saw the people, it wouldn't be as funny. You had to use your imagination with Al, which, of course, that's what radio is all about. But on stage, it's in a very big theatre like the Opera House Manchester. He was all right when he did the um, car park attendant, because they had a sort of cloth behind him with a whole pile of cars parked, trying to park his car, this man. Right hand down. Get your left hand right down. Left hand, left. Whoa, whoa. You'll have to go forward. Go on. No, don't straighten up. Forward on that lock. Now, back as you are. As you are. Right down the shade. Come on. You have six inches. Right down. Right down. Whoa. Whoa. Hold it. Luke, when I say right down, I mean right hand facing me. Is that clear? Now, we'll try again. Now, straighten up and go forward. Forward, I said. You know, you're not helping me at all. Come back at that. Come on, Amara. Come on. Come on. See, don't keep watching that side. I'll do that. Luke, if it'll help you at all, shut your eyes. <laughs> now, go forward six feet. Now, back on your other lock. No, no, your other lock. Switch it off altogether and come out. Leave yours where it is. I'll shift all these others. <laughs> He didn't add anything at all uh, on stage or television, but he was good on stage because, again, as you watched him, you could still put your mind to work. So the characters that you knew from the radio, and he was there doing them in front of you. He was better on stage than television because I think people are better on stage than television. 
because they're in charge. And I think Al Reed was like that. But to have a series where every week he was coming on doing a lot of the same routines that we'd heard on the wireless, which he could never do better than that, was not a good career move. Although it earned him a lot of money and it put the face in front of people, it didn't do him any good, in my opinion. He would have probably lasted longer if he'd just stayed on the wireless. Because what he had was gold. He had gold dust, did that man. He had gold dust in every phrase he uttered. And I think a short series a year on the wireless would have been ample to keep him going for years and years and years. Sorry I'm a bit late, love. <laughs> I got chatting. I'm to pussy. I'm to been chatting. <laughs> What's the matter, love? You look dejected. Has your mother been? <laughs> Well, she's not taking us on, is she, pussy? I've <laughs> done something wrong again, have we, pussy? <laughs> I think we have. We've blotted our copybook again, pussy. <laughs> no, love, uh, serious, serious, actually. I'll tell you who I've been with, love. I've been with, um... What's his name? Uh, Jackie, uh, Jackie, uh... Now, what's his last name, pussy? <laughs> nice lad. Uh, funny thing, he was asking about you. I wish I'd told him now. <laughs> oh, did you see that look she gave us then, pussy? Spare bedroom written all over it. He was the right man at the right time. I think that... Jimmy Logan. On radio, if you sat listening, you were observing. Someone had to draw a picture that you could see whoever the man was that they were talking about. And he was very, very good at that. He was very observant, very observant, and uh, meticulous in that uh, observation. And in those days, you would get a selection of gags and throw them together. But Al had that bit more to him, that bit more. There was more shape to it, there was more observation to it, and there was more truth to it than the normal comic. But Al Reed the person was an entirely different persona from Al Reed the comedian because if you met Al Reed, you were struck with the fact he looked like a very, very successful managing director of a company from the north of England. And uh, he stayed at our house for a week, uh, which was quite hilarious because he never stopped talking. <laughs> And the conversations went on and on. But the, <laughs> the thing about Al was, he followed you from room to room, still talking, but never, never shut off to him, because in all that dialogue, there was bits of gold. And so we went through the week with <laughs> Al forming companies. I mean, the minute you spoke about anything, you know, I'll take you to a lovely restaurant, nice resident and, and he'd sort of say you know hey that was a nice place you know that could be franchised we'll form a company and so as he was about to leave i said to him uh, just a minute al haven't you forgotten something and he said no no jim i don't think so i said uh, this he said what is it i said it's your bill you've been here a week bill and it went like this it said al reed sausage manufacturer horse owner and comedian. Accommodation in four post are two pounds per night. Breakfast, one pounds per day, brackets reduced. With egg and toast, add another pound. Dinner, three pounds. Listening to Al Reed's jokes, six pounds per hour. To forming companies, 762 pounds. And I said, you don't have to pay it right away, Al. I said, yes, you can send it on when you're doing a bit better. <laughs> The other interesting thing was, of course, his horses, you see. This is the other side of a personality. You've got almost three entirely different personalities within the one man. You've the personality of the businessman. I'm sure he was very good at that. You've the personality of the comedian, who by that time had made a very... He was wonderful for radio. He was wonderful. You, you could see the man talking, the character he was portraying. 
And then, of course, you had the horse owner. He was these horses that he used to race, you know. You'll Be Lucky was one of them. My first race horse? I'll never forget it. I'm at the Bristol Hippodrome. Played a week in variety there. And back in the hotel, telephone rang, and the voice said, How does it feel to own race horses, Al? Thought it was Jack Hilton. I said... I don't own a racehorse. He said, you do now. You bought two at Newmarket. I said, I did. He said, yes. All I want to know is, what are you going to call them? Now, I thought very quickly here. I was going into the Adelphi Theatre London for my first show, which was, of course, You'll Be Lucky. And I thought, I'll call the first one You'll Be Lucky. And I did. But I never thought for one moment that I'd be at the Adelphi in London for 12 months. Did I buck it? Are you kidding? <laughs> what, at 25 to 1, did I buck it? Billy Nevitt up an 8 stone 9, and did I buck it? Did I buck it? <laughs> a kid of 8 would have backed it. Over that distance, did I buck it? Did I buck it? Are you kidding? <laughs> what, at 25 to 1, did I buck it? Stone in half in hand, and did I buck it? <laughs> Billy Nevitt licked a quarter of a mile and did a bucket. A kid of eight would have backed it. Over that distance, did a bucket? Did a bucket? No, but I didn't have fancy it. My father phoned me up. He says, now listen, Al's got a horse running. It's called You'll Be Lucky. Put something on it. I said, Dad, I don't bet horses. I don't know anything about horses. He said, you don't have to. Just put something on so I can say to him that you at least backed his horse. And I had one of the girls a very good actress in the show and I, I phoned up I said listen I want you to there's five pounds or something put that on this horse you'll be lucky she said oh do you want it on the nose or on the I said I've no idea just put it in the horse anywhere I said and let it run in those days five pounds was a lot of money to put on a horse and of course when she went to the theatre looking for the bookmaker all the other actors who were being paid tuppence, you know. Oh, Jimmy Logan's going to put five pounds on this horse. Uh, you'll be lucky. And they said, oh, well, he must know that every other horse in the race has been poisoned or has only got three legs or whatever. He'll know that he would never put that money on. And, of course, the horse came in about fifth. And she said, I can't go back to that theatre again. They hate me, she said. I think I, think I, I, think I know why you sent for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I suppose 35 lengths behind does seem rather a lot. <laughs> uh, did, uh, did you have any money on it, Mr... Uh, <laughs> only, uh, I could tell it didn't like me when I got on it. <laughs> only... Look at it my way. I mean, I did say G up. <laughs> or, uh, or put it another way around. I mean, I've kept my weight down. <laughs> I mean, how would you like to water biscuits for your dinner? <laughs> Shall I apply for my trainer's license? It's hard to think of him as a comedian. His attitude was the attitude of the managing director, the businessman. That was the strange persona. You know, he could just sit and be lovely at a dinner party and uh, chat away, but then he would have to be forced to come in with something. I say, I say, one moment, please, you know. He'd have to do a little bit of his, his act. Al was a, a man who... Um, enjoyed holding people's attention he enjoyed that and he could do that by doing a little bit of his routines just look at this fog look at it it's getting thicker it's getting thicker where's the white light oh god where's the white light where's the white light oh that's it that's it i can see the cat's eyes now blimey it is a cat get out you cat do you believe it? Do you believe it? It's walking backwards. <laughs> I don't know where I am now. Am I on the pavement or what? 
I'll swear I've just gone between two telephone boxes. <laughs> right, game this is. What's that? What's that? What's this fella doing coming towards me on the left? Does he think he's in France? <laughs> Look out, you fool! On the wrong side altogether. You're on the wrong side. Oh, blimey, it was me. <laughs> Where the heck am I? Better turn sharp left. I'm sure I've come straight over a traffic island. Here we are. Here we are. I'll keep behind this bus. It's worth waiting. I'll let him take the lead. There's a few getting off and off. Fuck, there's a few getting on and off. It's taking him some time. Oh, blimey, it's a chemist shop. Where am I? I can't see a yard in front of me. I mustn't panic. Mustn't panic. Keep calm. Keep calm. I think I'd be better if I switch my lights off. Oh! Pitch black. Where's the switch? Where's the switch now? Where's the switch? Where's the switch? I don't know where I am. I don't know. As far as I know, I know that. My bed's bringing wet. <laughs> what was that? It can't, it can't. It can't. There I come, it is. Well, where the bl- where the bl- where the blade is? Ah, 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 are we? Are we? I'm in a flat. Pl- I'm in a flat, 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 flat. Feel, feel, feel. Do it, doing the spring snow, but bl- it's good doing the spring. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm going round in cir- cir- circles. What do they want to leave the gate open for? It's ridiculous. I'll make for the light. I'll make for that light. That's what I'll do. Oh, thank goodness we're on the level again. Oh, it's a relief to get back on the road. I can't see a... I'll swear it's getting thicker. What's that sign say? <laughs> Canal Road. Where am I? Where am I? Hello? Hello? Where are you? I'm here. <laughs> the right game, isn't it? Right game, isn't it? Real pea super. I've never seen it work. Can you switch your headlights off? I haven't got them on. <laughs> well, just stay where you are and I'll get behind you. Get behind him, I'll be made. I'll get behind him. They can shift these heavy lorries. Are you an articulator on your way to Aberdeen? No, I'm an oil tanker on my way to Aberdam. <laughs> on Right Monkey, you heard the voices of Dora Bryan, Jim Casey, Mike Craig, Jimmy Logan, Ricky Tomlinson, Marty Wilde, and Al Reed himself. I'm John Sessions, and the programme was written and produced by John Pigeon and Jeremy Pascal with help from Rona Campbell, Richard Klein, Paul Kent and Anna Murray. Right Monkey was a Gilmore Broadcasting production for BBC Radio 2. (laughs) 